Good morning. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Ravi Kulkarni, a resident of Phoenix, Arizona. This podcast is my forum where I engage people in a conversation that is interesting to me and hopefully to others as well. This is my way of learning and I hope to continue to learn while talking to people. I hope others will join me in discussing topics on politics, healthcare, science, philosophy and in fact almost every topic under the sun. Hi Ravi, uh, this is Sri. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer based out of uh, Michigan and uh, um, I'm pretty excited to be part of this podcast. Uh, I look forward to uh, hearing other viewpoints and uh, hopefully learn something new. Sure, uh, I am Sri Harsha. I live in Houston, Texas. I am an IT person as well. Uh, you know, the I would like to learn more from the people who know more, you know, definitely more than me. So I'm pretty interested in this podcast. Let's see how it goes. Uh, that brings us to uh, the topic of uh, today's conversation. Um, everyone, uh, all, the, all the four of us to, uh, who are here today uh, have a deep and active interest in politics. Politics, as, it, if I, uh, as we see it here in the United States, as well as uh, in India. And uh, we are all part of a WhatsApp group where we actively engage in bashing each other or uh, <laughs> supporting each other. Um, so today's topic is about uh, hyper-partisanship. Um, it, it it's a phenomenon that is very obvious in the United States and, uh, and elsewhere uh, in Europe, for example. And we we, see, uh, we are beginning to see a lot of it in India as well. And uh, so I would like to talk about uh, this phenomenon. Uh, observe things that are happening and uh, maybe think about why they're happening and what can we do as uh, citizens of our respective countries to, uh, to address this issue. So clearly hyper-partisanship is not a healthy uh, sign of democracy. Uh, so first, uh, let's just uh, define it, a dictionary definition. A sharply polarized situation in which political parties are in fierce disagreement with each other. So this uh, dictionary uh, definition only captures uh, part of uh, the actual phenomenon. Um, in our opinion, um, it, it's uh, more than that. It is because it's not just the political parties that engage in this kind of behavior. It is uh, it's a larger society. It is the lay people. It is the media. It is the uh, so-called um, thought leaders in the society, the talking heads. These are the people who also, uh, at some time or other, uh, become engaged in this kind of uh, behavior. And... Um, as with everything else in the society, there are, there could be some redeeming um, aspects of uh, hyperpartisanship. I don't know. Maybe somebody can educate me on that one. I have not thought in those in that direction. But um, that's uh, that, that, that's the topic. Okay. So uh, let me uh, play an audio that uh, I have chosen for this uh, occasion. It's just a short. Uh, audio of uh, Rush Limbaugh, who is the popular uh, talk show host in America. This war that's going on in America right now is serious, and there isn't much common ground between the two sides. That's what makes it so serious. You can't wish it away, but you do have to pick sides. It's not enough to say, well, both sides are equally as bad. There's not a big difference in them, and so... You wring your hands. There clearly is a difference. There is a side here that is posing the single greatest threat to the founding of this country since we have been at, uh, at World War in, in my lifetime. And they have stated that that's their objective. I'm not making this up. The left has made it very clear what their objective here is. And they've made it clear how they intend to pull it off, primarily with open borders and massive illegal immigration. As, uh, as step number one. So as distressing it is, as it is, you've got to choose a side. This is a time for choosing. 
not a time for wishing or hand-wringing. And it's a time that you must admit what is, is. So what you're saying is that uh, uh, it's, it's not the time to talk reconciliation. It is time to draw a line. And uh, it is time to uh, choose a pick a side, pick a side in this debate, whatever the debate may be. This is, um, I, uh, I mean, obviously, one can always uh, doctor such audios and make it sound any way um, uh, you like. But uh, in reality, these talk show hosts like Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, and uh, Glenn Beck, and there are many others, uh, Laura Ingram, and there are, these are the most popular ones in the U.S. The only reason I am uh, only naming the conservative talk show hosts is because they are the most popular ones. Uh, this kind of a thing uh, is not so common on the Democratic side. There is obviously a huge market for this kind of talk. It's, it's not unique to this particular one, one, uh, one segment of his speech. You, you, he, he's, a, he, uh, he's on talk radio every day. And uh, you can uh, you can hear pretty much similar things about any topic uh, that he chooses for that day. So it's the same with the others. The others may be less trident than he is, but he's one of the most trident and uh, obviously the most popular uh, radio talk show host. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, I think you. Uh, I mean, I get the larger point, uh, but I think this specific example that you picked was probably not the best one because what I felt uh, Rush Limbaugh was saying was uh, he was talking about something very particular. He was, he was talking about uh, the Democrats' uh, um, strategy of trying to get, uh, at least the way he sees it. Um, trying to uh, overwhelm the country with uh, illegal uh, immigration and migrants and use that to uh, force issues on everybody else. So that is something very particular uh, that he also mentioned that I got. I don't know if uh, there was something else in what he said. It wasn't very clear. But I got that much. And on that issue, he says... Uh, you have to oh, choose. You have to. It's time to choose. It's not time to, uh, because it's already there. It's uh, the, it's it's not something they're debating. It's not something they're discussing. Um, uh, they're uh, actually trying to implement it. So it is uh, definitely time to choose. Uh, and I agree with him on that particular point. Having said that, uh, uh, I agree. There's a uh, um, like a, uh, an atmosphere of uh, uh, hyper-partisanship, as you put it, uh, where uh, people are um, choosing to choose on every issue and uh, having the same um, attitude on every issue, whether big or small, whether it's already here or it's still being debated. Um, uh, it is, uh, I do see it, and it's not just... Uh, on the conservative side, it's everywhere. It's in U.S., it's in other parts of the world uh, that I'm familiar with also. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you on that. I'll, I'll tell you where the problem is. It is not that uh, immigration ha is not an issue. I, I agree it is an issue. But it is, a, it is the characterization of one side versus the other. That, that is a problem. And why, I'll tell you. Do you really believe that Democrats, first of all, Democrats are not one uh, unified bloc, just as uh, Republicans are not? There is no monolith here, right? It's not that uh, everybody's a robot and everybody thinks the same way, everybody parrots the same way. It's not, it's not true. So is it true that all Democrats want to bring in um, – these immigrants, legal or illegal, and uh, overwhelm the country just so they win elections. Do you really believe that? that is, is that, is that uh, really what you believe? It doesn't have to be all Democrats. At least the U.S. is almost uh, split 50-50, so uh, there's probably 150 million Democrats, give or take. But that doesn't mean 
uh, all 150 million are on the same page. But definitely the ones on the Democratic side that matter, uh, that are calling the shots, uh, that have the trust of the uh, remaining uh, 150 million uh, uh, minus the few, uh, they are uh, uh, they are doing uh, what he's explaining. So uh, it is a cause for concern and. Uh, it uh, and when you add the uh, propaganda on both sides, and when you add all the uh, uh, personal experiences of people who are directly affected by this right now, um, uh, you have uh, uh, I don't know if it's justified or not, but it's definitely understandable for people to be really concerned. Let us say there is a typical uh, American family. Uh, making do with, uh, say, around uh, seventy or $80,000 a year of income, family of four, they are barely making ends meet. Do you think they want to bring in uh, immigrants and uh, uh, have, uh, a, 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 if you take IT scenario, for example, IT, of course, uh, seventy to 80000 in IT may be low, but uh, let's say $120,000 uh, uh, of uh, uh, a typical American family, and uh, do you think they want all this competition actually bring in people from abroad and uh, maybe suppress wages and uh, uh, for those who are uh, uh, socially conservative? I mean, there are many uh, Democrats who are socially conservative. Uh, uh, they may have uh, their own strong opinions about religion, what is right, what is wrong, and all kinds of things. Do you really think that they want to uh, want their their values, their culture diluted in this manner? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. So my point is that it is a spectrum. The, the spectrum exists on both sides. So there is a lot that is common between what a Republican thinks and what a Democrat thinks. So in this kind of uh, reality, how can you say, even in this debate, how can anyone say, that uh, you have to pick a side, and is it is it productive? Does it lead to anything good when you choose side in this manner? That that's just really my question. Ravi, uh, this is Harsha here. Let me tell one thing. When you say that most Americans do not want immigrants to come in, and when you say that we should not pick sides, you are already picking sides. Right? That's uh, you know that's not true at all. That most Americans don't want immigrants to come in. They Majority of America do want legal immigration. Legal immigration benefits the country, and majority understands that, which is the reason we don't have a massive opposition for legal immigration, right? I, I did not say most Americans. You are Americans on the Republican both. side. Right, right, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, I, I did, actually, I did not say most immigrants don't want it. I'm saying that they have a similar... Uh, whether it is Republican or Democrat, they face the same day-to-day -day issues and they have similar concerns. That's what I said. I, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, majority of uh, Americans do want Im uh, legal immigration, and that is why it is encouraged uh, uh, over so many decades now. That's why we are here, right? That's why we are here. That's how and, we are. Right. And as long as the immigration or the immigrants, they don't directly affect their lives, right? They're fine as long as that doesn't happen. But as soon as that starts to happen, then the concern uh, you know, arises, which is where the opposition for the illegal immigration is largely coming in right now. See, uh, the hypocrisy, hypocrisy is that those who uh, oppose legal or illegal immigration, illegally, let's, let's take uh, illegal immigration, those who oppose it are the, many times, they are the very people who actually encourage it in, indirectly. So let me give an example. Uh, you talk about, uh, for example, you take the construction industry. A lot of the day, uh, day labor engaged in construction, especially in the southern states like Arizona or uh, uh, southwestern states like Arizona or southern states like uh, Texas, you will find that the vast majority of the people engaged in uh, these are uh, probably legal immigrants. I don't have uh, definitive statistics on that. But uh, these are the same people who are Republicans who talk very vociferously against uh, illegal immigrants and illegal immigration. I, and I'm, I'm, I'm not for 
let me make it clear, I'm not for illegal immigration. But I have sympathy for people who are already here. They're already here. They have taken big risk in their life. I mean, no doubt they have committed an illegal uh, act. They have, uh, they have committed a crime. But uh, if you think about uh, why they are here, what, what is it they are looking for, uh, I have certain sympathy for, for, for their cause. Uh, so there is, uh, if, on balance, there, uh, there is hypocrisy. There is, uh, uh, there is some truth to some certain arguments on both sides. So in this kind of scenario, uh, picking, picking a side only will lead to, um, uh, what is it called, uh, um, a deadlock. It's a, a gridlock. That's the right word. Nothing will move because we are still in a democracy. We still need certain majorities uh, if we want to do, if we want to pass a bill. If you want to make a constitutional amendment, you need uh, large numbers of supporters. And this cannot happen if, uh, if we continue uh, on this path. That is my, uh, that's my point. Well, uh, see, the thing is, uh, I mean, I agree with you. I have respect and sympathy for anybody who's earning a honest uh, livelihood uh, end of the day. Uh, whoever is, and, uh, and uh, 99% of them are, prob are probably just doing it for their families, their kids, and trying to put food on the plate. And I have sympathy with that. But the thing is, um, how do you differentiate how, uh, if you wanted to help everyone, if you wanted to take a humanitarian view of it, then... Um, uh, I could argue uh, on the same lines that uh, there's at least uh, 500 or 700 million people in India alone by Indian government figures itself that are uh, like 42% of them are uh, starving. Uh, there's uh, starvation with uh, uh, hundreds of millions of people in just India alone. And uh, if you take countries like China or Bangladesh, or uh, probably dozens of other different countries, uh, you could make a case that you want to bring all of them and help all of them. But at some point, you have to draw the line because you, even you personally or as a country, you can't help everybody. So if you are not going to help everybody, then how are you going to pick and choose? The only way you can pick and choose for a country is to have uh, uh, some kind of uh, legal immigration process and uh, have people fill out paperwork and uh, see what the criteria is, what uh, the country uh, agrees should, the criteria should be, and then you pick people based on that. That's the only way you, uh, you could do it if you want to do it objectively. Any I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to put you on a little bit of a spot here. Uh, you say that democratic leaders encourage this kind of BRC. Do you have some names or some evidence that they actually do this, or it is just a perception? No, it is. Uh, I don't have any documentary evidence, but it is uh, apparent from what they speak, what the stance they take, the, the, their positions on things, their uh, opposition to certain things. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just, I mean, they... I don't have sound bites right now, but I'm sure you can find uh, any number of uh, quotes or sound bites and uh, speeches of these. Um, uh, it's not, and, uh, and let me correct myself, it's not just Democrats. There is a lot of people on the Republican side also, uh, and the people have a right to be concerned uh, with both uh, sides. And on this particular issue, it is uh, mostly the Democrats uh, leading it, uh, so uh, they, you know, we keep saying Democrats are, uh, when it comes to this issue, but uh, you, you can uh, probably find a um, bunch of Republicans also on the same, like, uh, for example, the, uh, on most issues, you, you won't be able to tell McCain apart from uh, Hillary Clinton. So uh, more than uh, on the lines of Democrats and Republicans, I'd say it would, if we just uh, uh, analyze issues on their own merits, that would solve a lot of problems. And if people just took a stance based on uh, their own uh, analysis of uh, individual issues. Okay. Uh, it, this is, uh, this is, I think this is going to be typical of our podcast. 
that originally didn't intend uh, uh, one specific topic like uh, illegal immigration to dominate it, but that is fine. Uh, it's, uh, there is no hard and fast rule that we have to stick to uh, the broader topic that we are talking about or uh, anything. So if you don't mind, I would like to move on to uh, other things, uh, still keeping uh, in focus the hyper-partisanship. Um, anyone else wants to say something more about uh, immigration or uh, I can, uh, we can move on to the next. So um, I just want to move on to a uh, few other topics. Um, so this, this is not just about politicians. It has, uh, unfortunately, it has infected uh, the public as well. The, uh, there was a time when uh, people were political in their outlook, but not as much they are today. Uh, uh, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is just that now there are more outlets, more avenues uh, for people to express their opinion, uh, you know, such as the internet, social media, and uh, television, and so on and so forth. So you can see more of uh, more people expressing their opinions today than it was apparent. Maybe people did uh, that too before 20 or 30 years ago when there was no no internet or no public forums like there are now. So, uh, but my feeling now is that uh, it has increased, and that's a good thing, in my opinion. More engagement by, by people is a healthy sign of democracy, and that should happen. But what is happening at the same time is people are becoming polarized, polar in a, extremely so. For example, there was a poll done, I think it was done by Gallup poll. Uh, what they found is 60% of Democrats want their children to be married to other Democrats, and 63% of the Republicans said their uh, children want to be married to Republicans, which is, which is sad because it's, uh, it's, uh, there is a lot more to a person than their political opinions or their, uh, their philosophy, uh, philosophy on politics. So it's, uh, it's rather narrow, uh, uh, narrow criteria by which uh, to choose your life partner. So this, this uh, does affect uh, how people perceive politics. This affects how people vote. And uh, uh, the similar scenario is uh, growing in social media, and you see all these fake news, uh, fake news mills that are uh, spread uh, very, they go viral very quickly on Facebook, on WhatsApp, on Twitter, uh, and these things affect how, uh, how people uh, behave and how people vote. So, for example, there was, uh, uh, this was a few years ago, uh, Rahul Gandhi in India, uh, the Congress uh, leader, was uh, interviewed by Arnab Goswami, a famous uh, notorious uh, uh, TV uh, personality. He's famous for his uh, shouting. <laughs> uh, I, I found, find it really annoying. Uh, when he's calm and he's uh, talking on an even tone, he is quite reasonable. But once he starts, starts shouting, there's really no journalism going on there. They're just shouting. Uh, anyway, so there was this uh, hour-long conversation he had with uh, Rahul Gandhi. And I have listened to the whole, uh, whole conversation. It was, uh, I, wouldn't call, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it very uh, highly intellectual conversation. It was uh, pretty average. Rahul Gandhi is not, not, uh, not an intellectual, not, not somebody who is PM material, or I wouldn't even say he is eligible to run for a corporate seat in, in the town. But he's, he, uh, in that conversation, he was coached well, and he spoke reasonably well. Uh, there was nothing uh, extraordinary or uh, stupid about it. But if you see, there were snippets of uh, one or two minutes, uh, snippets that were share, shared across the social media. They make him absolute idiot. And this is uh, clearly, this is done by hyper-partisan people. Right. They want to portray, people don't have, many people don't have patience to sit through or listen to an entire hour-long conversation. But uh, people would definitely consume these minute or two-minute long uh, snippets of uh, out of context, out of, uh, uh, or sometimes even plain doctored uh, conversations. And this is not helpful for democracy. 
this is the this may make a certain person vote for modi or not vote for rahul gandhi but this is not honest democracy this is not uh this is not that something that should be encouraged by people that's what i feel have you uh, observed similar things in your uh, day to day uh, interaction with uh, social media yeah uh, ravi social media definitely is you know uh, one reason um is you know in social media everything is amplified right you have a free platform you can say whatever you want you don't have to face people but i do feel that the social media you know expressing your opinion the opportunity for people to express their opinions in social media right it's a good thing because we don't have to do that anymore in our day to day normal you know social life which i think was how it used to be before social media like 20 years back 25 years back right i think people were more vocal about it uh, socially um i i could just imagine right because i was not there obviously but uh, you know people had to talk people had to express their opinion somewhere if not social media somewhere right they had they had to talk to people they had to talk about politics in the office maybe in the parties maybe in the family gatherings and i i cannot i couldn't i cannot imagine that being nice right that you know, that conversation going nice so in that way i think social media has helped a little you know uh, we don't have to involve politics in our daily conversations anymore and uh, you know social media uh, of course you know you don't have to you know face people you don't have to talk to people so you can truly say what you have in your mind you don't have to hide anything which is a good thing i believe what is your opinion about this yes yes absolutely absolutely uh, in fact uh, uh, i don't know uh, this was probably uh, before your time uh, there was a tv hindi tv serial called nukkad it was very popular so the nukkad was about a group of people in uh, uh, in a small uh, chal what they used to call chal in uh, in uh, bombay right it's about day to day common people um a laborer or a teacher or a, uh, or tailor or somebody you know uh, so it it was about uh, their life and their uh, um it it was about uh, it, it was about them so how they how they go about their to day to day lives it, it was uh, it was quite funny and interesting so uh, in fact what i would like to call facebook and other social media it's nukkar right it is about we have lost that uh, either due to uh, whatever reasons uh, maybe we don't have that much time for going out of the house and engaging with people as we used to when i was growing up in the 70s and 80s uh, that it was different it was common we didn't have tv first of all we didn't have tv we didn't have internet there was no computers so the favorite pastime of children and even adults was to go out and engage with others so that 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 is no longer possible so social media has filled that gap right now you can talk to anybody any time uh, they are always available maybe um, uh, in in a limited way but uh, there are people available so social media has definitely filled in that uh, that gap and to the extent that people were politically engaged in the past they are uh, engaged now and but the good thing is i i, I like social media i'm not uh, i'm not trying to denigrate it it's uh, it has played it plays an important role but uh, it is also conducive to uh, this kind of uh, manipulation right manipulation by the political parties and their supporters and that's what i am uh, i'm cautioning against i'm i'm trying to uh, point out that at at some stage it becomes a systematic manipulation right if you if you see here there are a lot of talk of uh, uh, these russians setting up facebook uh, profit facebook profiles which uh, basically uh, manipulated uh, one way or the other i'm not uh, 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 personally i don't think russians did anything that affected the election to the extent that uh, trump got elected because they did something i'm i'm sure they tried to manipulate it in some way i'm sure there was some effect of it but uh, uh, to conclusively say that uh, um, uh, that uh, Trump was elected because of them. I, I don't think there's any justification for that. So anyway, coming back to the point, is that uh, the reason I brought up social media? I just wanted to illustrate the point 
that the people lap it up people lap it up uh, lap up such instances where fake news is propagated it is so common it's unbelievable uh, it's just uh, so obviously some of those things are so obviously wrong uh, but yet it is done it is done by uh, the establishment the political parties and their uh, pr machinery right it is uh, now uh, it has become very uh, obvious uh in fact uh, the bjp government in india they engaged uh, uh a, a very famous uh, i don't remember the name now a very famous uh, pr company from the united states uh as their pr company and they have done a phenomenal job of uh, to the detriment of uh, democracy in my opinion but they have done a phenomenal job of uh, promoting projecting modi as the savior of the country and uh, this is not helpful for democracy that is uh, that's my opinion and people need to see it so there are few other uh, uh, instances uh, but others please feel free to interrupt me because i'm going to go on and on and on yeah but, so yeah. ravi so uh, quickly uh, about social media i know um, it's uh, probably impossible to not talk about social media in today's context especially when we are talking about uh, hyper partisanship See, the thing is in my opinion uh, social media is a great thing our internet is a great thing um, i'm not so sure about social media but uh, internet definitely helped uh, uh, democratize this uh, uh, voices uh, because 20 30 years ago like you said it was either people would uh, doesn't matter how forcefully you had the opinion it you would only be uh, heard by your own family or if they gave up on you maybe your friends um, and that is it but uh, and the the big megaphones were being wielded only by uh, the big corporations and the state owned uh, 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 propaganda uh, slash news uh, radio uh, and tv channels so now the good thing with the internet is that it made that accessible to it gave it put a megaphone in everybody's hands and uh, i probably people like um rush limbaugh or products of that i mean they are products of a, a slightly a different age but um they were uh, ready and waiting when the internet arrived and um uh, it's not just rush limbaugh it could be even npr or it could be because uh, npr is a radio station but uh, there's millions of people who listen to npr on podcast so everybody has benefited from it and it's not just uh, uh, the government it's not just the npr and uh, rush limbaugh anymore it's it's also the average people on uh, all the hundreds of millions of people or billions of people with a facebook facebook account so the good thing is it has put uh, the power of uh, propaganda by, uh, um, uh, in the hands of uh, everyday people but having said that i feel the internet uh, while the internet is a good thing i i feel as far as this uh, uh, thing is concerned i think it we went past the point of uh, diminishing returns uh, a few years ago probably i would say before twitter before facebook really took off i think that was when everybody there were discussion forums there was uh, there was a little more investment people had to uh, do to why the opinions and also be heard than uh, today because today um, uh, i mean people were free to discuss anything 10 years ago and there was a forum for everything there was uh, there were internet uh, sites there were internet uh, discussion forums uh, but it wasn't a, a shoot and scoot kind of thing that you see today so today with twitter and facebook and even more with facebook i've seen um i mean there are uh, valid opinions invalid opinions all kinds of opinions uh, but uh, there is no uh, investment uh, or uh, any commitment or, uh, people can just share uh, what others especially with forwarding whether it's whatsapp or facebook or uh, twitter uh, people could share it indiscriminately and i i see i've caught myself doing that also it's not that I, i never do it but uh, there's sometimes uh, if we take one message there might be five different reasons i like it and three different reasons i don't like it but i'll still start, uh, uh, share it anyway uh, but 
when I share it, somebody else sees it, they might like it for all the eight reasons or all the three reasons I didn't like it and uh, not like it for the five reasons I liked it. So uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, stuff lost in translation and uh, it's not always, it doesn't come out always the way it's intended and uh, it, like uh, as I said, it gets amplified and beyond uh, and things get mangled beyond recognition. Um, so that is where uh, I think we, social media is a good thing, but we are quickly uh, marching past the uh, uh, point of usefulness uh, where the noise uh, is always in the uh, signal. Right, right. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. All that you, you have observed about uh, social media is true. Uh, but, but, you know, social media is, 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 a, is a medium. Right, it's it's a platform, and it can be used and it can be misused just like anything else. So, for example, now you hear terms like gerrymandering, right? Gerrymandering. Uh, uh, I mean, to those listeners who are not familiar with American politics, it is uh, the the. the uh, I, I heard I heard about it first time on Facebook, and uh, I mean, I'm sure if I had read uh, more widely. If I read newspapers, or maybe it's possible that I've heard it elsewhere. That's also possible. But uh, the social media is where I heard it and explored it further. So uh, U.S. national legislature is divided into two parts, just like uh, the Indian parliament. So there is the Senate and the House of Representatives. So uh, unlike India, where uh, the Rajya Sabha members are appointed or selected by state legislatures, here uh, everyone is elected. So uh, the, the House of Representatives are uh, uh, they are elected by state uh, the populations in the state and every state is divided into electoral districts. So House of Pre Representatives uh, is by numbers. So every uh, whatever percentage of population gets one member in the House of Representatives. Uh, so that way it's a more uniform distribution of the seats, whereas the Senate, every state gets two members no matter what uh, what is the size of the state. So the smallest state and the biggest states only get two members each. So um, the, the flip side of uh, House of Rep Representatives is that uh, every, uh, after every census, because the, 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 the population keeps migrating, uh, America is a land of... Um, migration, so people keep moving from one place to another. So as a result, uh, the distribution becomes unequal. So what they do is they redraw these districts every, uh, every 10 years or so, so as to keep it uniform as much as possible. Uh, if they did it in a ge uh, geometrical manner, uh, geographical manner, where uh, they're simply drawn based on actual population, it would have been okay. Unfortunately, just like everything else, the whole process has become corrupted. So what they do is uh, they try to put, put all the people of a certain demographics or certain political leanings in one district so that um, the, uh, it, it becomes uh, kind of locked in, locked in, right? So the members, sitting members of uh, the House keep getting re-elected again and again. This process is called gerrymandering. It is so cynical, it is so undemocratic, and it is so obvious. Everybody knows about it, but they keep doing it anyway. It is uh, it is legal, and in some, uh, of course, in some places uh, the courts have ruled against such process. But uh, it's still ongoing, and as a result, now there is no accountability. The representatives no longer have to be accountable for what they say and what they do, because they are assured of uh, getting elected next uh, next time. That is, uh, the House of Representatives are elected every two years. So uh, it's, uh, it's, there are about uh, a few dozen seats, such seats, where you can never hope to challenge a sitting member and win an election. And this is just another uh, way uh, how uh, the hyper-partisanship uh, is affected by the, by the political class themselves. And then yeah. Uh, there, yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, I mean, so hyper-partisanship, uh, you have to see it from both sides. One is uh, 
there's only w- one side stands to really gain from it, and the other side is just uh, play, uh, playing a team sport. So the the side is mainly, like you put it, the establishment that stands to gain from hyper-partisanship. It, uh, it's uh, uh, probably easier pickings for them if they can have people only on two sides of an issue instead of maybe 10 different sides. Uh, so it helps them. It is in their interest to uh, uh, not uh, uh, try to educate people on the nuances of an issue and just try to make it a, uh, a versus B on every issue. And that is where uh, uh, you have uh, people like uh, Arnab and uh, it could be Rush Limbaugh, it could be um, NPR host, and it could be anybody on any side. And that is what uh, they're pretty much doing. Most of them are uh, clearly uh, on one side or another. And um, I won't uh, want to speculate what the reasons are for it, but uh, there could be <laughs> very persuasive reasons why they are doing it. But uh, uh, I have no illusion that uh, uh, all these uh, um, legacy uh, media wielding their uh, uh, big megaphones are uh, uh, being objective on uh, practically anything. Um, so that leaves us with uh, people like you and me and uh, the rest of the masses uh, who have to deal with the hyperpartisanship that is being driven from the top. Uh, and that is where social media has uh, probably worsened the situation and it has given um, uh, these people, the so-called establishment and uh, their friends, uh, a tool to uh, herd people on um, one or the other side. And uh, that is done with uh, time-tested uh, uh, techniques of propaganda. There could be, uh, that's probably uh, an entirely different uh, topic. Uh, but it's uh, done by taking extreme positions. It's done by um, uh, um, discouraging any uh, critical analysis of anything. By uh, not just discouraging, by completely, uh, I I barely see any uh, nuanced discussion of any topic uh, anywhere on uh, the legacy uh, media. It could be radio, it could be TV, it could be the only place uh, you get to see. Uh, an issue discussed in uh, any uh, reasonable length or uh, depth is uh, probably on some private individual's blog or website or podcast or whatever. Uh, It's becoming increasingly uh, difficult to find uh, such things on these big uh, uh, dinosaur-sized media corporations. so that that is where people I feel have to uh, uh, learn to uh, be a little more nuanced and uh, uh, learn, uh, try to think critically. But that uh, comes naturally to some, doesn't to everyone. Uh, it's not. I'm not saying I'm <laughs> very uh, great critical thinker or anything. I've, we all are have, have our blind spots. But the good thing is, uh, but I feel with the social media, we are just uh, evolving as a society. And maybe hopefully in a few years from now, uh, when everybody, uh, it's already becoming obvious that um, uh, it's, uh, the, the hyper-partisanship is being, becoming obvious, but I think in a few years it will be even more obvious. And um, it might uh, turn people off just for that, or people might uh, catch on to the uh, 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 catch on to what is going on and uh, tune tune out, or they might uh, come and start uh, uh, fixing it. So I still I have hope, uh, but at right at this point in history, I think uh, social media is uh, 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 like anything that is growing, anything in uh, its uh, teens probably uh, growing fast and. Uh, I think it's uh, it's just uh, uh, worsening the situation right now. Hopefully, it will fix it in a few years. Right. So, uh, 
uh, it's uh, sometimes I take extreme positions. Um, so I, I believe, I firmly believe, there are in any society there are two sides. There is one side which is powerful and uh, which is part of the establishment. And the other side, which does not have power, does not have money, does not have uh, ability uh, to fight back. So these two uh, sides are, uh, uh, it is not, they do not have labels like uh, Democratic or Democrats or Republican. They are, uh, and that, that's, that's really what I believe exists. I am not, uh, I'm not uh, uh, saying there's a conspiracy going on that uh, there are some people who get together and actually plot to corner more power and more money for themselves. No, actually, let me rephrase that. There are such things going on, but uh, it may not be across the board. It may not be all the people, power players, uh, sit together and do it. There are, that's why we have these things like think tanks and then secret uh, closed-door meetings uh, of uh, the legislatures, or, uh, or the administrators, etc. cetera. Um, so these things exist. And they, uh, as you said, they, uh, they want to distract. They want to um, change focus of the society on things that uh, they want, you know, they can control. So there is a, uh, there's a joke of somebody who is searching for a ring under the street light. And someone in care came and asked me, what are you doing? And he said, uh, I'm searching for my ring. Uh, what happened? So I was walking there in the darkness there, and it fell off somewhere, and I'm not able to find it. So he says, why are you searching here well, if, if it fell there? Then he said, that this is where the light is. So obviously, you can see the futility of uh, that kind of uh, uh, thing. So the political process is basically what uh, it has become um, uh, it, it has fallen down to that level. Uh, people need to focus on core issues that affect uh, the society and as individuals. What are my core issues? My core issues are uh, having proper education, health care, uh, having a roof over my head, making sure I have a living, uh, uh, an, an earning that, that supports me and my family. These are the core issues for everyone. I don't think there are any exceptions to this. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking about majority of the people. I'm not talking about people who are born in the families of billionaires or royalty, etc. I'm not talking about them. So this is a common issue for all, whether yeah, I'm a Republican, Democrat, Independent, uh, Tea Party, or or, uh, or uh, whatever uh, sides they have now on the Democratic side, right? uh, Antifa, whatever. So it, it, it's the same. And yet, we are not able to stand together as one. There are lobbies in Washington, but we, we don't have a lobby. The common man does not have a lobby. Isn't that uh, very interesting? It's, uh, it, we are supposed to be the most numerous, uh, the most powerful uh, part of the democracy. And yet, uh, it is uh, whatever happens in Washington or New Delhi, it's almost always against me, against the individual. It, it is always in favor of the big companies of big uh, – I mean, there are exceptions, again. You know, I'm not saying everything is that bad. But there, on the whole, if you see over the last 20, 25 year, uh, years, no matter who is in power, uh, it's always the rich that get the tax cuts. It's always the big companies that get a leg up. It's always – the courts always rule against individuals and rule in favor of uh, companies. Um, it's uh, with some minor uh, exceptions. This is what happens. And why does this happen? How do, how do they get away with it? So some of the things that I have uh, listed, these some, some of the observations, ad hominem attacks, right? They attack, they vilify individuals. They say if, if anybody who raises a, uh, a voice against them, he instantaneously he becomes a communist or a socialist or a traitor, cheddi, langot, you know, all kinds of things that, that they do in India. And uh, here, uh, these other labels apply. And uh, by uh, vilifying people, they are basically dismissing their argument. They may have substantive uh, arguments or ideas or uh, uh, things that go against the prevailing political wisdom, and they completely dismiss it because that person is now a communist or, uh, or a cheddi. Uh, 
Uh, that kind of uh, labeling ad hominem attacks are common. The other kind of uh, attacks that they engage in is straw man attacks. So what is a straw man attack? Um, they are not able to uh, argue on the basis of a principle. Uh, so what they do is they construct uh, a parallel uh, idea or, or concept and say it's a fictitious scenario, and then they they try to demolish that saying that you think like this or this is what you intend to do, so let me say why it is wrong, and they go on, on a long argument about that. And people get distracted by such arguments. And this, this happens uh, very often. The third thing they do is red herrings. They create red herrings. So what are red herrings? Red herrings are uh, sea creatures that, uh, that confuse people, how they appear and what they actually are. So uh, they create these uh, red herrings, uh, which, uh, for example, a popular red herring in this country is uh, about gun ownership or, uh, or about gay, uh, gay people, their relationships or their status in the society. I'm not saying these are not real issues. They are issues. But uh, is it, for me, um, whether, somebody, uh, whether somebody's relationship, gay relationship should be recognized legally as marriage or not, is not one of the, my top priorities. My top priority, one of my top priorities, to ensure that my kids get an education, a 16-year college education with a reasonable price tag on it, with a reasonable value, quality. That, that's really much higher on my agenda than, than uh, gay relationship. And yet, the most debates you see in this society, whether it's on the Democrat side or the Republican side, it's, uh, it's about gay relationships, it's about abortion, it is about uh, gun ownership. So these are the things that they do. And uh, unfortunately, the vast majority of the people are not uh, willing to or able to uh, hold them accountable, hold them, tell them, no, this is not what I want to talk about. You talk about this. What are you doing about my education? What are you doing about my health care? That, uh, that accountability we're not able to bring politicians to. Uh, no, I just uh, wanted to, you know, you brought in the topics of education, healthcare, and uh, uh, what are the three essential things you said, education, healthcare, and what else? Uh, um, I don't know, you, you pick uh, education, uh, no, uh, no, employment. employment. Yeah, I employment. Uh, employment, probably. So that's, and, and you, uh, you know, you were saying that uh, instead of worrying about uh, these three things, uh, people get um, hyper partisan, right? So, and I just wanted to tell my opinion, right? And that's just where the politics and the partisanship comes in, right? When you say education, so obviously everybody wants good good education, but what makes good education is very debatable. And uh, one idea of good education is maybe very different from the other idea, right? Do we need more public schools? Do we need more private schools? Do we need more charter schools? And if we have more public schools, how much of the public fund or how much of the taxpayers' money should go there? And with the same thing with healthcare, right? Do we need universal healthcare? Do we need private healthcare? So, and these are the, you know, very ideological issues that divide the parties, right? And even if you try to deal with the very basic things in your life, you cannot escape ideologies, you cannot escape politics. And this is where you see all the you know debates raging in social media, you know, being hyper partisan. And this is where you pick sides as well, of course. That's a completely fair point. That's a completely fair point. I, my uh, my point is not that uh, there shouldn't be nuances or difference of opinion. My point is the focus, right? The focus of daily conversation, the focus of debates, political debates, media debates, uh, focus of legislation. Where should it be? Is there anybody? I don't know if anybody can make a point that healthcare should be affordable, education should be affordable, right? How we go about it? We can differ about how we go about it, but can anyone say we don't need healthcare or we don't need education? I don't think so. So I would say everything needs to be affordable, not just healthcare. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But uh, uh, th but these are top priorities, right? These are priorities. See, that is not where the di disagreement is. I mean, we're talking specifically about healthcare or uh, education. For example, healthcare. Nobody disagrees 
uh, that it should be affordable. I, I don't think anybody wants to pay more for anything, uh, not just healthcare or uh, education. The disagreement comes when uh, uh, you go one step further and say, how do you make it affordable? How do you want uh, uh, to uh, have a universal healthcare type of thing? Either? Or uh, you want people, uh, you want government to uh, take more from the uh, from taxpayers and pay it towards somebody else's. Take my taxes and pay to pay for somebody else's treatment. Or uh, so, uh, there's no free lunch uh, at the end of the day. So somebody has to pay for it, and that is where the disagreement uh, uh, stems from. Right, right, right. No, I, I agree. I agree that there are disagreements. There are uh, nuances to every one of these uh, ideas. Again, my objection is not to this debate, not the debate that we should have on education, the, the debate that con substantive debate that we should have on health care, on employment, on all these issues, all these important issues. We should have that debate. And it's okay that there are differences. But if we are willing to have that debate, then there, are, there is a possibility of solution. Unfortunately, that debate is not happening. And that debate, part of the reason why that debate is not happening is that the politicians are not willing to engage in it because they don't see quick results. They don't see support coming from uh, their true constituents. So, quote unquote, true constituents. Who are the true constituents? The power players, right? The lobbies. They are the ones who are encouraging these things. There is nothing in it for the lobbyists, uh, typical lobbyists, to uh, to make affordable uh, the education or healthcare affordable. So the debate gets diverted, right? That's why they create all these easy issues, right? Where there's the black and white issues uh, they create, such as gun ownership or uh, or uh, abortion, etc., uh, and that's where they divert people's attention. That's what I'm trying to say. That we need to shift back that focus, right? So these issues exist. They are intractable. They are difficult. But unless we engage in that debate, unless we take that pain to make it happen, nothing is going to change. Right. I agree with that. With what you said, and you know, these are the issues that uh, you know not everybody can express their opinion or not everybody can have one opinion, right? Uh, you know, issues like abortion, issues like gun ownership, you know, as you said, it's clearly black and white. Everybody has an opinion. You know, you shoot a person, they have an opinion about gun ownership. You pick a person on the street, they have an opinion about abortion. But, you know, ask them about education and healthcare, not everybody will be able to, uh, you know, articulate what they really want, right? And, uh, and probably that is the reason that they want to target these issues so that you know they have a wider base of vote, you know, wider voter base. It, it, everybody doesn't have to have an opinion. They can at least have, hold their representatives accountable. They say that these are my top ten priorities, or these are things that really matter to me. Please talk about these things. They can do it in. See, in America, uh, there is a good forum available because. Uh, every representative typically holds these town halls or uh, uh, meetings and then there are debates during elections. There are debates on social media or on uh, national television. So there are ample opportunities here for people to hold them accountable. If everybody says, whether you are Republican or Democrat, doesn't matter. Whether you like the, person, the representative or not, doesn't matter. If everybody says, this is what I want to talk about, right? then they'll be forced to change their tune. Then this will become the focus of their discussion and their debate and their dialogue in Washington. Uh, on the other hand, if we keep encouraging them by saying that I'm a Democrat, so I hate Republicans, uh, uh, please make sure that they don't talk anymore. You know, that kind of uh, uh, extreme partisanship, it is, it is self-defeating. It may make you happy for a moment, for the moment. It may... Um, it, uh, it may give you some kind of uh, shallow uh, satisfaction. But in the long run, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot. You're, I think the, uh, at least summary of what I feel is uh, the only long-term solution is public education. And that is where uh, there are some uh, individuals, there are some bloggers, podcasts, uh, 
who engage in this kind of substantive, uh, detailed, reasonable debates about issues instead of uh, uh, hyper-partisan arguments. Uh, one of them I must mention, uh, I mean, please, please feel free to mention your own favorite uh, bloggers or thought leaders. Uh, one of them I really like is, uh, is uh, Sam, Sam Harris. Sam Harris has, has a podcast. And he uh, he's also a public speaker. He goes from city to city. He I think he's also visiting Phoenix soon, and uh, hopefully I, I would like to go to one of his events. Uh, so he engages in uh, various uh, people from uh, on long conversations. These are not uh, 10 minute, 15 minute conversations. They are typically two hours long, one hour, two hours, or three hours long. And uh, my hope through this uh, podcast. In, a, in, in my own small way, to uh, to contribute to that kind of conversation. Hopefully, today's conversation has been balanced and uh, and meaningful in some some little, tiny little uh, way from my side, and uh, it will be useful for someone. I you know I always think about this right. Have we become more divided as a society recently? Maybe in the last five years, ten years. I don't think that is the case. You know, I often think that, you know, maybe we were always divided and we never realized. And, you know, we were always hyper-partisan uh, in our own ways. And we never realized that we were brainwashed to such an extent that we never realized that, you know, we have we hold a strong opinion about something. And uh, we were always blind, you know, we were always blind about the other opinion because we were never presented those opinions in our life, right? I, I will not give the example of U.S., I'll just give the Indian example, right? You know, these Gandhis, what the Congress did, right? These Gandhis and Nehru's and all those Congress, um, you know, the leadership, they put them in the textbooks, uh, you know, right from the first grade, first standard to 10th standard, you will read about them. And, uh, you know, you, you are always taught that, you know, they saved India, they saved all these things. Uh, they saved the society, and you read them about them in the textbook. And later, Congress Party comes in and they ask what votes based on these people, right? We have all these people. They have all the photos of these people, and they say, you know, vote for us because you know about these people already. How is it not partisan? Uh, you are brainwashed to such an extent from the childhood that you are presented no other opinion, no other option. And, uh, and 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 but BJP right when they realize this right they have to you know what they have is not just a party that they have to beat it's the whole ideology that they have to overcome and this is where they employed all these the you know quick the PR machinery where all they do is you know spread these kind of the fake messages or the propaganda machinery on the social media. And they have done it very successfully. You know, and they, you know, they, we needed something like that to overcome that mentality of the Congress, Congressy mindset, right? That's what they say. And they, they have, I think they have successfully done that. I, um, I don't see anything wrong in that, very honestly. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, so I so, uh, quickly, so yeah, I, that was a really uh, good point, uh, Samir, that I agree with that, that the, probably, uh, 20 years ago, we didn't realize that we were in a uh, strong disagreement with others because we didn't even know what their uh, opinion was on anything. So that being said, and also they've given the example of Congress and BJP, yes, Congress did all those things, and uh, every government everywhere in the world that I'm aware of has done similar things. And, uh, uh, and uh, it is one thing to see BJP's response as... Uh, 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 understandable is not justified, but but then end of the day that doesn't solve anything, and that doesn't solve anything for the people. It might it might help BJP or another party win elections. It might help them keep, keep them in power, but end of the day it does nothing to further interests of uh, the common man or uh, society. So it's uh, it's just uh, as, as as far as the common person is concerned, it's just now they belong. They just picked a different team. And uh, the uh, team is uh, still not doing them any favor. So um, that is where I feel, and that is where uh, I feel this hyperpartisanship, uh, like Congress and BJP or Democrats and Republicans, they have, uh, they stand to gain from it. Nobody else stands to gain from it. They stand to gain from it by getting votes because it's easier to hurt people in 
two camps than in uh, go and invest and get it from 10 different uh, uh, divisions of people. So the only solution is for people to become more aware. I mean, hyper-partisanship is possible only when uh, people are misinformed, and people could be misinformed for different reasons. Either they never um, studied about it or uh, because... Uh, if they didn't study about it, that can be fixed by studying about it. But these days, with social media, that is where I fought social media for it uh, once again. Because uh, people can be misinformed, not just because they didn't study about it, but they were actively misinformed against it, against something, misinformed about something. So uh, that is what uh, uh, social media is enabling uh, people like uh, political parties to do. Um, so it, uh, I would, uh, people also have to own some responsibility and make a conscious effort to um, dig deeper and uh, uh, and uh, consult a variety of opinions and uh, make up their mind. But that is easier said than done. And I, that's where I said it will probably take a few years for things to settle and either people to um, not... Uh, value uh, or uh, uh, take anything uh, online seriously until they do their own research or people just uh, tune out and then it will probably rebalance itself. That is, uh, that's an excellent pick. It's, uh, social media is exacerbating the situation by spreading false news, fake news, or totally biased news, doctor videos and audio, etc. So, uh, the, the, the antidote for that is, of course, as you said, you know, people need to be better educated. People need to be aware of uh, the game that is being played. And uh, the way I, uh, I try to educate myself is try to listen to the opposing point of view. What is the opposition saying? What, is Repub what are the Republicans saying? What are the Democrats saying? In fact, I uh, go to the extent of reading or listening to the extreme uh, partisans like uh, like something on MSNBC, for example, or what Rush Limbaugh is saying. Even though I find it a lot of it completely distasteful, but it gives you an idea about what they are saying. And 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 often, uh, even even in trash, there could be gourmet meal, right? So, in a similar way, uh, in some things that they say, there's a lot of what they say may be trash, but there is some kernel of truth sometimes. And you glimpse that kernel of truth in in uh, such such places as well so it's good to that's why it is good to be not part of uh, echo chamber where everybody says what you want to hear it, it it leads to confirmation bias you believe in something and you keep looking for evidence that it is true and you will inevitably find it on the internet so uh, instead if you look for something that actually opposes what you believe in then you are uh, li more likely to be on closer to the truth that's, that's, that's how I look at it. So uh, uh, do we have more time or uh, should we conclude at this stage? Uh, I'll drop, uh, I have to go. Okay, yeah, in that case, uh, um, yeah, we'll let us conclude. I think uh, it has been an interesting conversation. Uh, just one last thing I wanted to say before we conclude. Uh, when Modi was elected, he claimed that uh, he's a Pradhan Sevak. He's not a Pradhan Mantri, but he's a Pradhan Sevak. So my take on that is treat your representatives as such. They are Sevaks. They are not your bosses. They are not your leaders. So treat them as your Sevaks. Hold them accountable and every opportunity possible. Don't treat them as gods. Don't, especially those who misbehave or who demonstrate that they are not good leaders or good uh, politicians. Don't invite them to uh, these ribbon-cutting ribbon ceremonies. Instead, invite somebody from your community, somebody who has, you know has truly done something for the society. Hold them accountable. Demand that they, uh, they engage in public debate. Modi is famous for not engaging in public debate, and that is uh, no matter how effective he may be. I don't know if he's effective, but he's uh, definitely not effective by not communicating and not uh, holding him, himself publicly responsible or accountable, uh, that, that's certainly not a good sign for democracy. Hold them accountable. Make them come to public debates. Make them uh, hold town halls where 
public is free to ask them questions and get some answers. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this, this is not very common in India. This is very popular here in the U.S., and it's a good sign of this democracy. So India needs to learn something from America. And uh, uh, continuous engagement by public, uh, better educated uh, public, better engaged public is the only way we can fix these problems, and that is my take on it for this podcast. Sri Harsha, any parting comments? Uh, I don't have anything to add, Ravi. I really like this conversation. I hope we have more of this. We certainly will. Okay, I think uh, that brings us to the conclusion of this uh, uh, this conversation. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, we hope to have more such conversations in the future. I don't know when it will happen next, maybe next month. And uh, uh, I will share it on uh, public media such as uh, YouTube or, uh, uh, or something else. I, I haven't decided yet. Um, once... Uh, once we complete editing this, I'll share it in a day or two. Uh, thanks again, and uh, hope to hear from you.